I think that's safe. There you go. Because yeah, because uh, I think Mark and Tom did a recording on the computer, and the computer blew up, and so they had to redo it. So now I know to do it to the cloud. So I wanted to welcome everybody to Mighty Underdogs. This is our CEO roundtable roundup, an information session. So I'm going to do a brief, try to keep it at 20 minutes and uh, go through why do we have roundtables? How is this roundtable a little different than the hundreds of other roundtables that are out there? And wherever you are on your journey, a roundtable is going to be in, out in the wind somewhere because there's many of them for all different st stages of your career in business. So at uh, Mighty Underdogs, we believe that, that building a successful business doesn't have to be so complicated. It's the human part that makes it complicated. I'm looking at Heather, she's smiling because it's about the systems that make it easier. And if we just let the systems run it and use our processes and use our technology, it's the people that make it complicated. And that's what makes it difficult about being a business owner is it's the people get in the way. So how do we work with that? And the places that we're gonna focus on in our roundtables, it's not teaching you how to do marketing a functional department. It's not teaching any of the functions, which many of the webinars you get out there are around functions. And so what we look at is the, the three barriers to growth. It's leadership, systems and structure, and market dynamics. These are things that prevent growth from happening. And when we have our roundtables, we're listening. And when I talk to you and listen to you, I'm really listening for where are you in your journey? Because we get so focused on our, our business and what we're doing, or we get sucked into the issue and not really look at where we are in our process. And there's, cause there's tools everywhere to help you uh, manage through whatever issue you're coming up with. So the three places that we have found them are leadership, system and structure and market dynamics. And then with that, you put in some successful habits that you follow. Um, remember I worked with 1500 CEO roundtables. That's about 5,000 CEOs over the last 30 years. And so we have found that these three areas are the biggest profitable barriers that we run into to profitable growth. And there are successful habits that people have come up with that we share. We know what makes this work. And it's for CEOs and executives usually are not taught how to be a CEO. And you're not taught how to be a business owner. Even when you take up all the, start, the startup classes, there's start, how to start a business, but it's not how to run a business. There's very few leadership classes in any of these startup programs. And so we spend a lot of time on leadership um, and how do you affect your community? Many of those, many of those issues, because that's where you find employees. And I was just on a, a webinar that talked about culture. Culture, when companies now have the big resignation, right? People are leaving left and right and they're wondering what's happening. There's no jobs out there. Well, there's, well, we talk about all of those in our group because you need employees, you need workers. My son works at a place called Scented Leaf in downtown Tucson. And he, they have a line out the door of customers all day long. And he has a waiting list of people that wanna work there all day long. And he's been open for nine years. And so how do we get more companies to have that kind of a story? And that's what we work on. It takes work and it takes effort. It's not about your marketing plan. It's not about a function. It's about how you run the business in your mindset. So to give you some background and some basis for where you are, 31.7 million companies are registered with the IRS. And that is, so I've been giving this presentation for about 22, 23 years. And it has always been, always, we've even had people challenge it and go back and check. 28 million companies have been registered on a regular basis because as many that start up, 
we lose 80 to 85% of them. So there's a constant churn. And so the 28 million has been about the right number for, oh, for a long, long time. The last two years, we've added 4.4 million new startups. And I think you see out, you hear out um, the government and a lot of government agencies are giving millions and billions of dollars out away to startups. And so there's, it's really churning up the demand to be a startup and funding startups and supporting startups. But the piece they're not talking about, we still are losing 80% of them. So what's happening in that space? That's what we, we like to address that spot is after you had your third round of funding and you've been in your business for two or three years, now what? Because the funding has stopped and you have to actually be living on your customers and the products and services. So 98% of those 31 million companies are 10 less than 10 employees, less than 10 employees. So what I wanted to show on this sheet is of the 31 million companies in the United States, 98% of them are fewer than 10 employees. If you have 2,000, uh, I would check that number because I'm not sure it's even 2,000 anymore. It's at least 1,500, but we've lost some of those big, big, big companies on the far right. And so out of the 31 million companies, 2,000 of those, which is a very small percentage, um, have 500 million in revenue or 1,000 employees. And so you have 2% out of 98% is on the left-hand side, less than 10 employees, less than a million in revenue. But the people that make the rules are the ones that are on the far right. Those are our institutions. So they're the you know, companies that have more than a thousand employees make the rules for the people that have less than 10 employees. That makes barriers to growth for us being small businesses how do we grow with the rules that are set up to keep us out? Because you think about that, those big, those big companies that have a thousand employees or more, they don't, they don't want more new competition coming through. And so they change the rules on a pretty regular basis. We've seen that happening with Facebook and we saw it with Google. Both of those were underdog companies. So was Amazon, was an underdog company when they started, they were an underdog for a long time because people didn't believe in them. I mean, y'all remember those stories. It's not gonna work, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna work. It's part of the vaporware, vaporware, the dot-com. Some of you are old enough to remember the dot-com era. They started up at that time. So they were not supposed to win, but they are. And look at all the problems that they have with government and with big business. They have a lot of regulatory problems. So that's to keep you small. They want you to stay down in that 98%. So we talk about this and the, the brick walls that are in there have stayed in there because those brick walls are consistent. You will run into brick walls. You will run into them. What we try to do in our round tables is in, like with Mark and myself, Molly's gonna be coming into this presentation too. And we've, We've done this so many times that the, the, the walls are predictable. Humans are predictable. The service you're providing changes, but the game that you're playing has not changed. So the walls are predictable. You, we know what happens when you get to around 10 employees. We know what happens when, uh, let's say somebody wants to come in. Oh, I see who it is. We, we know what happens when you try to grow to 50 employees. We know what happens when you try to get to 200, 250 employees. There's certain milestones, <clears throat> excuse me. There's certain milestones that you will run into the barriers. And what most companies try to do is slam through the wall and you get hurt, you get killed, you get shot, you die, you run out of money. So we try to help you go around them or go over them, not try, not go through them. So 
So, and you run into that, you start to see the issues like halfway between the two walls. So I have some people in our, in our groups that have 20 employees, 20 employee, employees is the magic number because at 25, you start to have to change your systems and structure. Because you, if you're at 25, you're gonna go to 50 pretty quickly after that. So how do you set up? Those are things we talk about. And the, the, again, the predictable, when I say predictable, they are very predictable. Leadership, when people go from a sole owner to adding a partner, to adding a, a right hand or a left hand, whatever, however you wanna call them, but they are pretty much equal. So how, how are you equal when you started it? So you're not quite equal. So what does that look like? And then you grow into this, the C-suite. So I have a lot of people that ask that. When do you become, you know, when is the right time to develop a C-suite? So you have a CEO, a chief operating officer, chief financial officer. At what stage does that get put into place? That gets us into systems and structure. Because leadership, leadership is also the old terminology, but we still use it, is delegating. How do we delegate what needs to be done? It doesn't say, how do we align? How do we collaborate? How do we partner? How do we share? It doesn't say that. And so our systems outside in the environment that we work in are still in a get delegation model. So you run into conflict. And I wanted to mention to you too, I have another person, another client that uh, he picked a CEO, his partner to be a CEO when the CEO, what I say, people don't really understand what a CEO's job is. A CEO's job is to manage conflict all day, every day, all the time. And if you're not managing the conflict, you're either creating the conflict or finding the conflict. So you're, it's conflict resolution all day long. And conflict is good because that's what causes growth to occur. When, you know, if you're not a C is CEO material. We have some tools and discussion about what CEO is and how do you get to be one to learning conflict resolution, learning conflict management, but that's not for everybody. You can be a very strong support person and run the office, that's the COO. They're a very strong person, but they don't enjoy conflict. So there's different roles for everybody to play. That gets us into systems and structure as you grow from one to 10 to 20 to 25 to 50, your systems and structures change. My, um, Heather has some of that experience. You've seen that, whether what size company, what size customer you work with, their structures are different and their systems of what software they should be using will be different. And the next piece is market dynamics. Market dynamics are things that we cannot control, things outside of our space. So our customers have to change. They will always change. They will always be different. And um, government regulation comes into play. Taxes come into play. There are a lot of things on the outside that we can't do anything with. Our competitor moves in. The bigger company says, oh, you're getting too strong. You're getting too powerful. Too many people like you. I'm going to change something, and I'm going to give my stuff away. And you charge for it. causes a problem. So how do we work with that? And then this is the sheet that I use, a spreadsheet. It's not a spreadsheet, it's a grid, a template that I, when I'm listening to the issues that people are running into, I'm looking at across the top are the levels that go with the, bit, the, the brick walls that we showed earlier. So the 98% is in the level one, the 2% remaining are in two, three, and four. So, that helps you visualize where those barriers are. And the, here you have a white line that breaks up where the walls are. And then on the left-hand side, you have leadership, system and structure, and market dynamics. Those are your three areas that you're always working on, always. And then um, the, it's like, a, like a, a checkerboard or a grid sheet that I use on where are you? You can be a small company of two people, and be really good at, you know, be really strong at the level two for leadership. And you could be um, level four for systems and structure because you're an IT company 
you're a software company, you have to think like that, you have to look like you're a large corporation. And so you have systems that support the level four. But in market dynamics, you're, you're not making any money. Any customer is a good customer. You take anything you can get. So revenue is your, is your driver. So you're out of balance. Because not every customer is a good customer. I think we all have seen that and experienced that. If you're still focusing on revenue, then I would spend a little time and money and let's move through cash flow because your goal is really to get to predictable profitability. How do you do that? Well, focusing on gross margin, I like to focus on net margin, which is something different. And cash flow. A lot of companies I find don't manage their cash flow very well. So how do we work on getting better at cash flow, get functional systems in place, and work on the delegation and the responsibilities within the leadership it means you have to grow and develop people to take those roles. Questions, comments yet? Quick break, okay. Then there's successful habits because you're, you're continually working on, on this sheet right here on your what is your company and the levels that you're in and the three areas on the left, the leadership system, the structure, and market dynamics suck money. They suck money. And so you can't invest in all three at the same time. So it's really knowing what are you working on? Where are you spending? Your, where do you need to spend your money so that you can grow? Because remember this, this chart is about barriers to growth and how do we overcome? If we can, if we can predict, we can overcome. So this is to help predict what kind of issues are you running into and how do we work through them? Once you get that, there's, there are successful habits that lay on top of it, which are a priorities, rhythm, meeting rhythms, and metrics. And so we talk about those three things in our roundtables so that you all can share, how do you find our priorities? I was reading an article um, a couple of weeks ago and from Harvard Business Review that talks about most of the strategic plans that are out there are not strategic plans at all. They're just a series of goals. A strategic plan is not a series of goals. A strategic plan has goals in it, but that's, it's more about how do we prioritize so we know what to leverage and we focus on the leverage, and we focus on the learning, we focus on the rhythm, which includes the people, and then we, have, we measure. And we have the metrics that support our big, hairy, audacious goal. What is that? And what does that look like? Okay. So, and then here's your business journey. Um, people, this chart is intended to show, well, where do CEO roundtables fit? How do I know if I'm ready to be in a CEO roundtable or not? Because not everybody is ready. And then some people are more than ready and there are different, different groups of CEO roundtables. Since I was a Vista chair for 10 years, what I like about these new, these little roundtables that I'm trying to put together is it's, meant, it's intended to be a bridge to get you to the, the higher level um, CEO roundtables like Vistage is $25,000, $30,000 a year. This is not that, but there's practice that, and behaviors and habits that need to put, be put in place in order to get the returns of a $30,000 yearly fee. So where it fits is there's tons of uh, education that is free out there. The internet has really provided for the free space and free knowledge and free education. So you take classes, you start with your number one on the, the bottom right, classes, workshops, and webinars. There are, you could do free every day, all day, be on Zoom every day, all day, and still not get through all of them. They're free and free is just, just that. There's only so much you can do with free. Then you have to implement and execute. Workshops and webinars aren't about implement and execute. So then you go to, you have to add the one-to-one -one mentoring, which mentoring is free, because that's what the word is, free. And then you also have CEO coaches, and you have life coaches, you have consultants, you have 
um, schools, you know, fee-based school, that's where fee-based starts is the transition between free to get some fee. And then once you kind of go through, uh, have enough mentors, I still have to implement and execute. So I go to trade shows and conferences to help me practice and to learn and also get your price up. Because individual personal development needs to be in every CEO and every business leader. You have to carve time out to continue to learn. Because if uh, your company will only grow as much as you do, if your company stalls out, which it will, that it's t it means you haven't done enough. You've grown as much as you know. So we have to increase your knowingness. And that's what the roundtables are for too, which you'll see in number four on this journey is small business roundtables begin. Because now there's really no more, you can't, there's not a, the workshops, the webinars, the mentoring, the all the free starts to become, I've heard it already and I'm, I'm done with that. Now I need to move on and actually have to implement and execute. So the round tables are to help you with the implementation and the execution, because we all do it differently. We can be given the same tools in the same business and it'll all be different. So what does that look like? I try to describe those, the um, round tables are like a kaleidoscope. We all have the same kaleidoscope and there's, we all have the same chips inside our kaleidoscope, but depending on where you move that kaleidoscope, the light that comes through it, the chips will change. And if you turn it, the chips flip and you see something totally different. You used to see blue, now you see green. And you didn't really move too much or you didn't spend any more money and you still got the same kaleidoscope and you got the same chips, but it looks a lot different. So that's what we're trying to do is give you new views on your existing business or your customer market dynamics. Okay. Um, now how does a round table work? A roundtable works is we have it's a founder's team, peer-to-peer -peer real life experiences. So it's from you, you can't send a substitute. I can't bring an assistant. You can't send a family member. It has to be you. And if you have a family member, because most people start with friends and family. So with friends and family, then they have their own group because they have issues about you. And so you need to have your own group so that you can talk about each other without each other being in the room. Because remember I said earlier that people are the, are the barrier to growth and, it, and friends and family are the biggest barriers because of loyalty. There's a lot of things in there. Um, my PhD is in family, family businesses, big family businesses and that become public. I mean, Ford Motor Company is large, was a family business. Steelcase was a family business. Um, who else? Uh, Spartan Foods is a family business. Uh, there's uh, millions of family businesses that have grown up to be big business. So how does that work? And how does it, what does that happen? How does that happen? I build um, dynasties. I don't build the flip. So two different, two different things. I want to help you grow your business. There's small groups of eight to 10 because we're virtual. So we think that's a good number to help keep us together. In each meeting, you'll get a topic or a tool or an issue. So something, each one of those three things will help you grow to the next level. Because we're, as humans, we reward people that are the same. And we don't like outliers. So we have a tendency to, we, as humans, we are very predictable. And so we think our issue is only our issue or only happens to us or something bad only happens to us. No. The issues are the same for everybody, just at different times. And the problems that you have are the same for everybody, just at different times and a little different dynamic that goes with it. So that's why we can share and help each other and say, oh, I've been there before. It just looks a little different, but you have been there before. So we talk about that. And then we also have a formal process for issue processing. If you can learn and adopt the issue processing format, it'll help you predict and solve problems before they occur in your business, which will help give you more traction and move faster. Because you can see problems before they occur, but we don't solve them until they occur. So how do we get ahead of those problems? Okay. 
Um, we focus on establishing your BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal, and the envisioned future, and try to keep that in front of you at every meeting so that you don't lose sight of where you're trying to go or what you thought you were going to do. And we also help you develop a board of directors. If you have a board of directors, how do you work with them better? If you don't have a board of directors or an advisory board, how do we get one? How do you create one? Because everybody has to have one. Just how do you do that? So we go through that. And you can use your roundtable as a practice, as an advisory board. Things that we do and things you would do with your board, whether it's an internal one or an external one, is your business canvas model, your growth plans, your growth budget. I know, I know not many people talk about growth budgets. They talk about operating budgets, but we talk about growth budgets. Staffing requirements for growth. That's always, I find a challenging one too, because people don't do that. They wait till they get the business and then they try to figure out how they're gonna staff it. So if we put, if you're gonna put a growth budget together, you can also put a staffing budget together. What is that gonna look like? And what are the requirements? So you know, if you develop your own people, how much do you need to spend and who are they? And if, or if you need to hire from the outside, what does that person need to look like? I usually try to, I'm, I don't do that work, but I help educate you on making sure you look for somebody that's big enough that you can grow into, not someone that's following and just following orders because it's not gonna be big enough to help you grow. And then digital marketing plans for growth. What does that look like? Okay. Uh, how does the meeting work? How does the day work? Uh, usually there are three, four hour days, you know, one day a month and it's a morning, it's typical. What we're trying to do with virtual is how do we adjust that? So you still get the benefits, but in a different, a different structure because you're not gonna sit on Zoom for three hours and have a meeting. Man, you'd lose everybody. So how do we break it up? We thought we would do, and I'd let the group decide how they wanna break it up, but this is a suggested start, is that I think 90 minutes on Zoom is probably enough capacity for people. And we go through, you know, check-ins, strategic learning topic. We will always have personal action statements. So you have something that you commit to. We are your accountability partner and force you, make you, encourage you, help you to make sure that you um, follow up on your, what you committed to do so that you get the habit of doing what you say you're going to do, which means you can't say yes to everything because you can't possibly do everything. So what do you, being very mindful of what you say yes to and why, because it has to reach your um, growth plans. So and support your growth plans or else you just end up waste, taking up a lot of time and not making progress. So we work on that with you, okay? Uh, confidential at all times. We don't have people coming and going. If we have a group of 10, that's the group of 10. And, and you get to know each other, you support each other, you call each other, you see people, see each other in between the meetings. We uh, mentioned we have personal action statements. Um, you have to participate in, in that your contribution is participating. So if you're gonna, if you, you usually don't sit and listen because you have too much, hopefully we've pro poked and prodded enough that you have something to say. So, <laughs> So you'll, you'll be able to participate in there and develop and grow your plans. So we'll be checking on all of your plant growth plans and make sure that you have them and check on them. Uh, the fee is $2,400 a year broken into two payments. I do the two payments because uh, one, the fee is small enough that to do a monthly fee doesn't, doesn't make sense. And to commit for a whole year, I, I think sometimes people, we all can get lazy that, oh, I paid for the year, so I'm stuck. I don't want you to feel stuck. And if you're not getting what you need to grow, or if you're not growing, I also put this in my personal proposals to clients, that if you're not doing your part, then it gives me an opportunity to fire you as well, because it's not working out. I don't want to fail because you didn't do something, or that you're not showing up, or that you're not growing. So I have a commitment to you to make sure that you grow and you have a commitment to me to attend and to do the assignments and to do the work and to participate. And after six months, we can do a review, see how it's working. If it's not working for either one of us, we have a chance to fix it, change it, adjust it, or say it's just not for you at this time. And that's okay. 
our first meeting, our first actual meeting is next Thursday, the 18th. Do I have anyone? I don't think I have anyone in here from Detroit. I shouldn't. Okay, just Molly. So I'll have Molly talk after that. And it's 9 to 1030. Okay, so I'll send you a meeting notice and I will send you an invoice at the right at the same time so that you have both. I'm a stickler on the meeting agenda, the meeting times and the dates, the fees, we can work through the fees. So don't get panicked that I have to pay my fee before I show up next week. You don't. It's show up next week. Let's talk. Let's see. Let's experience it. And then you'll have a better decision point on if this is something that's for me and if I want to continue. Okay. And we are mighty underdogs. Uh, we are passionate about small business. We've all worked in small business. We've donated and volunteered thousands of hours to small businesses. And oh, what I wanted to mention because of that, uh, we do have a uh, business underdogs is a nonprofit. We do have a person that um, is willing to give scholarships. And so they've co they'll cover half of the price. So for you, it's $1,200 they will pay the other $1,200, okay? I forgot that part. Um, and Molly is in Detroit and I'm in Tucson and there's our contact information. So with that, I will end the discussion. Stop the recording, let's see.